Perhaps he is the world's greatest batsman. He's certainly one of India's most popular heroes. Yet he's only 26, and it's barely been 10 years since the world first heard of him. So what is he like? And more importantly, how does he live with his incredible fame? To find out, stay with me as I talk to Sachin Tendulkar. Sachin, you were born in April 1973, and in a family where most of your brothers and sisters are really much older than you. Were you a spoiled child? To a certain extent, when I was a kid, but uh, the biggest transformation in my life was uh, when I changed my school. Earlier, I was in uh, New English School, Bandra, and then I changed to Shardashram English Medium School. That is when uh, the biggest transformation uh, came in my life. I became very serious. Earlier, I was so notorious. Uh, it was hard for my parents and my elder brothers and the friends to control. So you were a great prankster as a child? I was. I still. <laughs> I still do some. So were you a naughty child? Were you always getting into trouble? Uh, every day my father uh, used to check my body or he must have fallen somewhere here and there and he could only do that when I was sleeping. So the moment I woke up, when he touched my elbow, I woke up. Oh, this is where you got hurt today. I used to say, yeah, I did. And then I used to go back to sleep, so I was always up to something. There are stories that when you were a young child, maybe five or six, in fact, you used to be a bit of a bully as well, and that you always liked to be the tough one in the community. I love fighting. <laughs> Watching a lot of Hindi movies, uh, I wanted to be Amitabh Bachchan in my school. And uh, it, was, it was great fun. We used to have two groups. So another guy looking after a B group, I used to look after A group. So. There used to be quite a lot of fights. And did Ebu always win? Most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but before cricket, in fact, your sporting hero had nothing to do with cricket at all. It was a very different person who you idealized, wasn't it, when you were young? Well, I, when I was young, uh, I, I was the only one in our colony who was, who was backing John McEnroe. And the rest of the guys used to back Bjorn Borg. So he, he has always been my hero, and he still is. And uh, you used to even imitate his hairstyle and apparently wear his headbands as well. I used to roam around everywhere like that. With a headband, sweatband, and a tennis racket. <laughs> Were you good at tennis in those days? I was too young to be good, but, uh, well, we used to also play hand tennis. So, because most of the guys didn't have the racket. And uh, that was great fun too, but uh, it was basically for enjoyment. I gather it was your brother Ajit who first spotted your real talent and did a lot to guide and support you. Is that right? Absolutely right, because uh, I surely can't imagine what I would have been without my brother. Mm, I surely wouldn't have been here talking to you. Uh, he's uh, done everything for me, which uh, a normal brother won't do. He's something more than a brother to me, which uh, I find it very hard to express myself, what, what I have. Uh... Now, when you were 11 years old, he introduced you to someone called Ramakant Acherkar. Did you realize at that age that this man was going to change your life? I was too excited to think about all those things. And uh, first day I went there, I was too tense, too nervous. I couldn't bat at all comfortably. And uh, he said, OK, this guy is going to take some time. Why don't you bring him after six more months? So my brother said, uh, give him another chance, because I've seen him. I know how he plays. And this is not the way he plays. Give him another chance. And uh, fortunately, my coach agreed. He said, OK, I'll keep, him, uh, keep an eye on him for seven days. And uh, I didn't realize that. I was just enjoying my net sessions. And he said, OK, I think he's good. Why? why what, what about changing the school? That's how I changed my school. I was earlier in the uh, English school. And I joined Shardasham school. And that was the turning point of my career. Because uh, the earlier school, there was no cricket. So, In fact, Mr. Cherkar used to get you to practice in the nets by using, I believe, one rupee coins to help you keep your concentration. Is that right? It's uh, perfectly right, because I still have those coins. And uh, whenever I used to get tired, I used to bat in four nets at a stretch. And in the last net, when I was tired, he used to keep uh, one rupee coin on top of the stump. And he used to say, anyone who gets him out can take this coin. 
If nobody gets him out, Sachin is going to take this coin. And it was a big thing to get that coin from Asar. And uh, I used to try my level best not to get out. And uh, I lost a couple of times, but I have 13 coins with me. So you, <laughs> so you made a bit of money on the side as well, huh? I did, but I didn't, I didn't spend. I gather it was during this period that two of your closest friends came into your life, Vinod Kambli and Atul Ranade. And they say that Sachin was a big bully. Whenever he was on the bus with us, he'd make sure we missed ours and we went with him. Yeah, I was always up to something when their bus came. And when my bus came, I, I used to say, OK, my mother must be waiting for me. I have to go. <laughs> so I used to make them uh, remove something from the kit bag. OK, show me your bad, this and that, and try and distract their concentration. Looking at the numbers of the bus, I used to be quite a bully. And this habit of playing pranks, this habit of teasing and having fun, has this stayed with you even now? Still there inside me. <laughs> I use it sometimes when the, the time is right. Yeah, I'm a, sort of a person who would uh, take uh, his time to make friends. And once I've known somebody, I cannot be serious at all. I'm always up to something. I believe that when you played your first match at 11, it didn't look to anyone as if you were going to be the star batsman of all time. Because <laughs> despite today's great record, I believe you got out for a duck the first two times. My first two matches, uh, we used to earlier play in a colony, just uh, in front of the buildings. And uh, I was a decent player there. So all my friends had a lot of expectation. And they had come to watch me. I said, OK, I'm going to show what I can do today. Went into bat, first ball bowled. I came back, uh, the friends asked me, oh, what happened? I said, no, the ball kept low. You know, The wicket wasn't so good. And that's how I avoided the conversation. I said, the ball kept low. And look, where are you going this evening? And there's, let's go and eat bhel puri and all that. They said, OK, you're playing tomorrow. We'll come again and back you tomorrow. I said, OK, fine. The next day also, I got on first ball, zero. I had to make up some excuse. So I can't remember what I said. But uh, the third match, I scored seven runs. And I was on top of the world. <laughs> I said, yes. I've, uh, achieved something in life, and this is how it's going to go. The funny thing is that in those early days, and in fact right up to the age of 14, you actually thought that you were going to be a pace bowler. Is that right? I always somehow liked fast bowling. And uh, I still do like. I like watching fast bowlers. And uh, wanting to become a fast bowler, I had gone to Chennai for uh, the selections where Dennis Lilly was going to conduct EMRF Pace Pulling Foundation camp. And uh, nobody knows this, but I was also carrying my pads and bat. <laughs> so I ended up batting the nets. On the last day, I was batting the nets. Instead of becoming a fast bowler, I batted there. And I said, oh, he's too small to become a fast bowler and all this kind of thing. So I batted there, enjoyed, and came back. OK, 1988 <coughs> was possibly one of the greatest years in your career. Do you remember in February? You were playing in the Harris Shield. That's when you created with Vinod Kambli the world record of 664 <coughs> runs not out, the highest partnership. But I gather right through that period, your coach was actually trying to signal you to declare, and you refused to see it. My coach uh, sent a message through somebody. And that person was trying to tell me from the boundary line that you, you have to declare now. Your sir has given me this message, and he is ask you to stop it here. If you have the guts, you get runs in the finals. Don't, don't uh, thrash them here. Save it for the finals. You've got reasonable score. Stop it here. But we were somehow you know, just trying to ignore him. And finally, at lunchtime, he said, OK, now you had it. You have to call up your sir. He is waiting for your phone call. When I called him up, the first question was, what is their score? I said, sir, we haven't declared. I said, what do you mean? I had sent a message to declare. Why didn't you declare? I said, uh, Vinod wanted to bat. So Vinod said, no, 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 don't say this. I said, yeah, Vinod wants to talk to you. I said, sir, I'm batting on 349. Can I just make one run, and then we can declare? I said, if you do that, you have to deal with me in the evening. So we had to finally declare and start the game. And in December of that year, but still in 1988, you got your first chance at the age of 15, 
the youngest person ever to play cricket for Bombay in the Ranji Trophy. Do you remember that match? I went in to get a hundred. <laughs> I got it. I always go in to get a hundred. And sometimes I get it, sometimes I don't. But my idea is to go out there and score runs. And uh, I remember batting on 92. I think a left arm spinner was bowling. And uh, I played one cover drive and on drive to reach 100. And uh, then we had to declare. I cannot forget that moment. You are a very ambitious and determined person, aren't you? I like to score runs. I don't, I don't like losing at all. Do you hate it when you lose? Would you say to yourself when you get out for a duck or if you get out before you think you should have? I have to take off my anger on somebody or somewhere. So I prefer to sit alone for a while till I cool down. And uh, well, it all depends on how I've got out. I may get out on duck, but uh, if it's a good ball, fair enough. I mean, the bowlers are playing for their country to get me out, and I'm playing for my country to score runs. So I mean, it's always going to happen that way. OK, let me take you to the age of 16. It's November 1989. You're just making your debut for India. You're the youngest Indian ever to play test cricket for this country. And you walk out to bat. Were you nervous? I was terribly nervous. I didn't know what was happening around me. And uh, I said, OK, fine. I'm just going to go and hit the ball. I went in there. I got beaten. I, I can't count them on my fingers so many times. And I said, OK, I cannot deal with this. This is the first and the last test match you will be playing. I don't think so. You're capable of handling this. And I got out. I got back to the dressing room. I said, oh, what have I done? Playing for India, such a terrible performance. So I didn't expect this. And I was talking to myself. But I looked at myself in the mirror. I said, OK, you can't run away from this. When you get another opportunity, you're just going to go out there and try and hang around, spend as much time as possible there. And fortunately, I got another chance in the next test match, which I was not expecting. OK, Sachin, I'm going to take a break there. I want to come back in part two and talk to you about the cricket that you then were playing for the next 10 years for India. We'll be back in just a couple of moments. See you then. Welcome back to Face to Face. My guest is Sachin Tendulkar. Sachin, there are two reverses that you've suffered in your cricketing career. The first was in 1987, when everyone thought you should have won the best junior cricketer trophy, but you didn't. At the age of 14, did that hurt? It did. I was very upset, because uh, I'd scored maybe two times, two times as much as what uh, the other guy had scored, and uh, taken maybe 40, 50 more wickets than him. So I was very upset. Uh, but uh, another great thing happened to me, which is probably more than this Junior Cricketer Award to me. I received a letter from Sunil Gavaskar congratulating for my performance uh, that particular year. He said, uh, if you go through the fixture, you'll find one name missing who's not got a junior cricketer award, and he has not done that badly in test cricket. And uh, it was him. So I, I was very thrilled, and uh, that's something special to me. The other reverse you suffered came a lot later. You lost the captaincy after having had it for 15, 16 months. What do you think went wrong? Well, I think. Uh, I was very upset about one fact. We came so many times close to winning the games. But uh, we somehow couldn't. I mean, the ones which you don't play well up to your standard, you lose them. And that's fine. I mean, sometimes you don't get it right. It's fine. But when, you, when things are happening the way you want them, that is the time to win the game. And those games we were losing. So I was very upset. And that is where I thought we went wrong. What do you think happened? Was it that people didn't try enough, or was it just bad luck? Well, sometimes uh, it happened, uh, sometimes careless shots, sometimes uh, bad luck. So it's a combination of everything. There was a time in South Africa, wasn't there, when you were looking as if you were going to win the test, and the rain fell just on the stadium itself. I was 
I was uh, so disheartened. And at lunchtime, when we got back, we were on the verge of winning that test match. And everybody was like, OK, yes, we are going to win this test match. And uh, we were just waiting for the lunchtime to get over so that we can go and finish the match. And it started pouring like anything for a couple of hours. We couldn't do anything. We, we were, all of us were almost in tears. And then we got an opportunity. And they batted for a while. It was uh, called bad light after that. And we had to stop the game. So that was very, very disappointing. Does that sort of thing make you believe in luck and bad luck? I do believe in luck. Because uh, not only uh, the minus points I'm discussing, but the plus point, I would uh, also like to say, we were playing last year against Australia in Sharjah. And in the finals, I think uh, Fleming was bowling for me. And I left ball. I was a fraction of a second late. And while leaving the ball, it just kissed the inner side of the bat and missed the stump by that much. And I got four runs for that, that shot. Ended up scoring 100, and we won the tournament. So that's a. Uh, but if luck hadn't been with you, you could have got out on this occasion. Yeah, I would have been out on maybe four, five, six. I don't remember. Does this sort of thing make you superstitious when you're playing? I'm not so superstitious. Uh, I, I just have this habit of wearing my left leg guard first. <laughs> Always. Always. Why have you never got a double century in test cricket? You've come close to it, but you've never really done it. How do you explain that to yourself? I'm trying to find why I haven't got it. <laughs> I haven't got it yet. Uh, I think uh, I just need to be more determined, more focused, concentrate harder, and uh, not to give up fight till the end. You seem to sound as if the fault lies in yourself. Is that how you see it? That there's something missing? I think uh, it's very hard to find what is missing, because I've tried everything. I've tried to slow down my game. I've tried to accelerate. I've tried to bat normal. And uh, somehow I've got out. So. I just got to be patient and try as hard as possible. But does this worry you? Not really. I mean, uh, getting 200 is not as important as winning the test matches for India. OK. In 1996, you got married to Anjali Mehta. How did you and where did you meet her? We met uh, through a common friend of ours who was studying medicine with her and occasionally played cricket with me. And he said, OK, we have to go out for dinner. And it was at her place, so that's where we met. Was it love at first sight? Not really, not really. So were you very careful in choosing your wife? Well, uh, I've known her for almost 10 years now. And uh, as the time passed by, we realized, OK, I found my partner. So it, uh, it wasn't uh, love at first sight. Does she share your passion for cricket? Earlier, she didn't know anything about cricket. She was into medicine and only books, nothing else. So uh, gradually, she developed interest. She started watching my games. And uh, now she understands a little bit about cricket. And is she very tense when you're batting? I gather she hates watching you actually while you're batting. Oh, yeah, she gets very tense. Uh, and uh, things, are, things are very difficult. Even my brother gets so tense that He's, he's become so superstitious. Uh, he doesn't allow anybody to watch the game. Okay, no no family member is allowed to watch the game live. They can watch the recorded matches. So when Sachin is batting and the whole world is sitting watching, your actual family is not watching at all? They are not watching. They're too tense. <laughs> <laughs> are you a family man? Are you close to the family? Yeah. It's mainly with them, mother, brother, my friends. Playing downstairs, I, I play a bit of table tennis as well. Every evening, I'm downstairs playing table tennis. When you say friends. playing downstairs, this is in the same area and the same colony where you grew up. That's right, yeah. This is important to you, to stay there and be with the people that you spent your childhood with. It's very important because uh, it's very normal to me. I'm, I can become what I am, actually, and not uh, what I should be outside, outside the colony. I can come back to normal again. When, I, when I'm there in the colony, it's, uh, to my friends, it's OK. It's just one of our friends. That's it. They aren't overawed by the big names such as Tendulkar? Not really. And it's just uh, what I want from them, just one of, their, one of their friends. So you look for people who treat you like normal? 
people who are not over impressed with your prestige and status? I really like that because uh, that's very rare, to be very frank. And uh, it can only happen with the guys who are very close to me and very dear to me. King, you must be perhaps the best known celebrity in India today. But is there a cost to this fame, to this fan following? Well, sometimes uh, when, I go, when I go out with my family, uh, it's very difficult. I would just want to spend some time with my wife and my friends. But that doesn't happen. Can you take Anjali to a restaurant, go see a movie, just go shopping? I can take her to a restaurant, but not uh, shopping or movie. I think uh, sometimes uh, when we go out in the evenings, it's so important that we spend some time alone with each other outside our house. It's so important that we also get a chance to lead our personal life. It doesn't happen so. I mean, people would uh, just uh, barge in and say, can I have your autograph, please? Or maybe just pose for a photograph. It's sometimes uh, very upsetting. I mean, I would, I would surely want to sit there just by myself and Anjali next to me and spend some time together. It's so difficult. But uh, on the other side, I find it very interesting because it's all happening because people like me. They love me. They like my game. They surely want me to perform well and do good for the country. That's why it's all happening. So I appreciate it as well. You're 26. You have probably at least five, maybe even 10 years of cricket ahead of you. But have you ever asked yourself the question, what then? Not really. At present, I'm just thinking about what I'm going to do next for the country and uh, what my responsibilities are. And uh, I feel uh, I should not think about anything else other than cricket. Maybe, yeah, a few things here and there, but uh, my focus should be always there on cricket. And is there a cricketing goal, a cricketing target that you want to achieve? I always set targets, uh, but uh, I never disclose them. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? So that if you miss them, you don't have to admit to it? Yeah, I think uh, people are surely expecting something from me. So that's fair enough. I mean, if you're expecting something, that's fine. But what my expectations are, I should just keep it to myself. And if I can live up to my own expectations, I'm going to do a decent job for the country. And I'm waiting for that. Sachin, I'm absolutely confident you're going to make those targets. Thank you very much for talking to us. Thank you very much. Yeah.